Hey everybody, welcome to day 85 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. I'm so glad you decided to join me again today for this very interesting section of Scripture, but a dark section of Scripture, Judges chapter 17 through 19. Malcolm Gladwell describes how hush puppies' shoes that were, you know, invented in 1958, um, they had basically become so unpopular that the company was deciding to phase them out. But they reached a tipping point in 1994 and 1995 when some influencers in the Greenwich Village uh, area of Manhattan or the Soho area of Manhattan suddenly took an interest in having hush puppy shoes. They went to the resale shops and found them and started wearing them and because they were influencers. Next thing you know, hush puppies have become the hip thing to wear in the clubs and bars of downtown Manhattan. By the fall of 1995, designers were beginning to feature the shoes in their fashion shows and by the end of 1995, they had sold 430,000 pairs of hush puppies after almost phasing them out because nobody wanted them. And the next year, 1995, they sold almost 2 million pairs and now the hush puppies were in every mall in America. This was a tipping point for good. Something had changed and the dominoes started to fall for good. But some tipping points are for bad and that's what's happening today in Judges 17 through 19. We're going to have a tipping point where the black sheep tribe of Dan leads the nation of Israel into idolatry that lasts for 500 years. But this is where it all begins. Judges chapter 17 verse 1 in the King James Version of the Bible with updated vocabulary. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you, about which you cursed and spoke of also in my ears, see the silver is with me, I took it. And his mother said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had entirely dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make an engraved image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. Yet he restored the money to his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made from that an engraved image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod, a teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the men departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, Where do you come from? And he said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, Stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of clothing, and your provisions. So the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to live with the man, and the young man was to him as one of his sons, and Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that God will do me good since I have a Levite for a priest." chapter 18. In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites sought out an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen to them among the tribes of Israel. And the children of Dan sent from their family five men from their coast, men of valor from Zorah, from Eshtael, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said to them, Go search the land, who, when they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in there and said to him, Who brought you here? And what do you do in this place? And what do you have here? And he said to them, Thus and thus has Micah dealt with me and has hired me, and I am his priest. And they said to him, Ask counsel, we request of you, of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. And the priest said to them, Go in peace, before the Lord is your way in which you, in which you go. And then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people that were in it, how they dwelled careless and after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. 
and there was no magistrate in the land that might put them to shame in anything, and they were far from the Zidonians and had no business with any man. And they came to their brothers, to Zorah and Eshtael, and their brothers said, What do you say? And they said, Arise, that we may go up against them, for we have seen the land, and see it is very good. And are you still? Do not be lazy to go and to enter to possess the land. When you go, you shall come to a people secure and to a large land, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. And there went from there of the family of the Danites, out of Zorah and out of Eshtael, six hundred men appointed with weapons of war. And they went up and pitched camp in Kirjath Jerim in Judah. Therefore they call that place Mahanadan. Unto this day, behold, it is behind Kirjath Jerim. And they passed from there unto Mount Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Then the five men who went to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brothers, Do you know that there is in these houses an ephod and teraphim and an engraved image and a molten image? Now therefore consider what you have to do. And they turned there and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even to the house of Micah, and saluted him. And the six hundred men appointed with their weapons of war, which were, by, which were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. And the five men that went out to spy the land went up and came in there and took the engraved image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood in the entering of the gate with the six hundred men that were appointed with weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and got the carved image, the ephod, the teraphim, the molten image. And then the priest said to them, What are you doing? And they said to him, Hold your peace, lay your hand on your mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be a priest in the house of one man, or that you should be a priest unto a tribe and a family in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. And he took the ephod and the teraphim and the engraved image and went in the midst of the people. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle and the luggage before them. And when they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men that were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they cried unto the children of Dan, and they turned their faces and said to Micah, What is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, You've taken away my gods which I made, and the priest, and you have gone away, and what more do I have? And what is this that you say to me, What's the matter with you? And the children of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows run upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. <clears throat> and the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. <clears throat> and they took the things which Micah had made, and the priest which he had, and came to Laish unto a people that were quiet and secure, and they struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Zidon, and they had no business with any man, and it was in the valley that lies by Beth Rehob, and they built a city and resided in it. And they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan their father, who was born unto Israel, but the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the children of Dan set up an engraved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up, Micah's graved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Chapter 19. <clears throat> And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him, and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly to her, and to bring her again, having his servant with him, and a couple of burrows. And she brought him into her father's house. When the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the young woman's father, retained him. And he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. 
And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he arose up to depart. And the damsel's father said to his son-in-law, Comfort your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And they sat down and ate and drank, both of them together. For the young woman's father had said to the man, Be content, I pray you, and tarry all night, and let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him, therefore he lodged there again. And he rose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. And the young woman's father said, Come for your heart, I ask you. And they tarried until afternoon, and they both ate. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, See, now the day draws toward evening. I ask you to stay all night. See, the day grows to an end. Lodge here, that your heart may be merry, and tomorrow get early on your way, that you may go home. But the man would not tarry that night. But he rose up and departed, and went across from Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two burrows saddled. His concubine also was with him. <clears throat> and when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, I ask you, and let us turn into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside here in the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. And he said to his servant, Come and let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night, in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in a street of the city, for there was no man who took him into his house to lodge. And see, there came an old man from his work out of the field at evening, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he sojourned in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Where do you go? And where do you come from? And he said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From there I am, and I went to Bethlehem, Judah. But I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man who receives me into his house. Yet there is both straw and provision for our burrows, and there is bread and wine also for me and for your handmaid and for the young man who is with your servants. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with you, but let all your wants lie upon me. Only do not lodge in the street. So he brought him into his house and gave provisions to his burrows, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. Now as they were making their hearts merry, see the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, surrounded the house and beat at the door and spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brothers, no, I ask you, do not do so wickedly, seeing that this man has come into my house. Do not do this folly. See, here's my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. I will bring them out now, and you humble them, and do with them what seems good to you. But to this man, do not do so vile a thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth to them. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then the woman came in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And see, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said to her, Get up and let us be going. But no one answered. Then the man took her up upon his burrow, and the man rose up and got into his place. And when he had come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said, There was never such a deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider it, take advice, and speak your minds. And that ends chapter 19 of the book of Judges. Well, okay, so 
We are talking about Bethlehem again. I don't know if you've noticed it, but uh, this is the second time we've talked about Bethlehem. There was the bad young Levite from Bethlehem who uh, propelled the idolatry of Micah into the tribe of Dan, which now is going to spread all throughout Israel. So the bad young Levite from Bethlehem. This is a concubine whose home area is Bethlehem, and her uh, husband goes to Bethlehem to retrieve her. And when we get to the book of Ruth, there's going to be a whole story about Bethlehem and the family of Ruth. So we sometimes call this the Bethlehem Trilogy. You notice that Micah and the Danites are initiating the official homegrown idolatry of the Israelites right in their own homeland. So this is a uh, this is an idolatrous shrine that they set up in Dan, higher than the Sea of Galilee, uh, up north in Israel. And this shrine, this place of worship, is going to compete toe to toe with the Lord's real tabernacle in Shiloh. And the Lord is going to be angry, of course, at this idolatry. And you'll see that Dan, the tribe, is going to be punished for this. In chapter 17, verses 1 through 6, it all starts with this fellow named Micah, who is not a Danite, uh, but Micah was a thief. He stole money from his own mother. He confessed to it, apparently afraid of his mother's curse. So he confesses to it, and she blesses him, and they take the money, and they make idols out of the money, and an ephod. Once again, it's an ephod, just like Gideon made earlier in the book of Judges. Remember, an ephod is like a sandwich board garment. You have a panel in the front, a panel in the back, and then straps to hold the two panels, and then a belt to keep the thing snug around your body. This is an ephod, and the priests wore these ephods. So this is Micah making himself an ephod with the money that he stole from his mom and got returned to him, and it's a big mess. In chapter 17, Verses 7 through 13, you see that this priest, uh, this uh, lapsed Levite, becomes priest to Micah. Micah says, oh, uh, yeah, come into my house. I, I have an ephod for you to wear. I have these idols, and you can be an idolatrous priest. And Micah figures that this Levite would be a real boost to his credibility and the credibility he had with his false gods because he now has a Levite for his family shrine. And then Micah assumes that having a Levite will curry him favor with God. And of course, the exact opposite is going to occur. Then in chapter 18, verses 1 through 19, we have the Danites who are leaving the land down south uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, across from the Dead Sea. This is the land that Joshua and Eliezer, the priest, appointed for them. But they haven't conquered the land very well, and they want something easier. So they send an entourage up to northern Israel, higher than the Sea of Galilee, much, much higher uh, than the land that, that was promised to them by Joshua and Eliezer. And uh, they find that there is a people up there that they can attack. Well, on the way, they stop and they visit Micah. They see he has an ephod. He has a Levite for a priest. And they bear this in mind. Next thing you know, after they spy out the land up north, they return down south and they tell their Danite brothers, oh, there's a land up there. We should definitely go. It's tranquil. They have no army. They have no mayor. We could go take over that land easily, so let's do it. So 600 Danites, men of war, travel from down south by you know the Dead Sea area along the Mediterranean. Uh, they're going to go up and they're going to attack Laish, higher than the Sea of Galilee. And as they go, they stop off at Micah's house and it occurs to them that they could steal these shrine objects of worship. They could force or coerce or persuade the Levite to be their priest, and that's exactly what happens. Because of this, Dan now becomes the black sheep tribe of the nation of Israel. They're going to establish idolatry up north, higher than the Sea of Galilee, that competes with the true religion of God. It is because of this that when you're reading the First Chronicles genealogies, Dan is not even mentioned. Uh, they have become the black sheep tribe. Also, in Revelation chapter 7, when the tribes of Israel are listed in the end times for protection against the end times plagues, Revelation 7 makes no mention of Dan.
the Danites get no protection against the plagues. And you'll see that the, the uh, Danites have now become anti-heroes. Uh, they are villains. Um, Micah is a villain because he started the whole idolatrous thing. The Levite is a villain because he has now betrayed his calling as a servant of the Lord. And the Danites are villains. Once again, there are no good guys, there are no heroes, and nobody wins. In chapter 18, verse 31, they set up Micah's engraved image in the tribe of Dan up north, higher than the Sea of Galilee, and they have become pagans, pagan competitors to the true God. In chapters 19 through 21, we come to the last story, really, in the book of Judges, and it is a terrible story. In chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, we have a different Levite, not the one who's a priest up in Dan now. We have a different Levite, and he has a concubine who comes from Bethlehem. The concubine is unfaithful to him, so she flees to her home area in Bethlehem. After four months, he goes to retrieve her, and he's bringing her back to his home area. And they stop off in Gibeah, which is in the tribe of Benjamin boundaries. And the Gibeahites do the same thing that happened with Lot in Sodom. And the same sort of thing happens only this time. This man, a Levite, who has a concubine, which he shouldn't have, but whatever. He has a concubine. He pushes her out to these men. And they abuse her all night uh, so severely that she dies. He is so cold-hearted, he pushed her out. And you saw that the old man was so cold-hearted, he offered the men his daughter. But this is just so awful. Every part of this is awful, right? And um, this cold-hearted Levite then walks out in the morning and finds his concubine has, has died. He doesn't know it at first. He says, well, get up. We got to get going. I mean, he's so cold-hearted. I mean, this is just impossible, right? It's so awful. And she can't get up because she has died. So he takes her to his house. He cuts her into pieces, sends the pieces all over the 12 tribes of Israel, and says, this is what the people of Gibeah in the tribe of Benjamin have done. We have to go after them. So the 11 tribes get together, and they promise to uh, bring capital punishment on the Gibeahites who have perpetrated this terrible rape. So they go to the Benjamites and say, we want the Gibeahites who are responsible for this to be brought to justice, capital punishment. And instead of bringing them out for capital punishment, Benjamin stiffens up and says, no, we stand with our brothers. You can't have them and you can't punish them. Well, then the 11 tribes promise to uh, get vengeance on this, and uh, this is where we're going to stop today. But what's our great uh, life lesson in all of this? And it's the lesson of tipping points. In their wildest dreams, the Danites could not imagine on that day when they stole those shrine idols and essentially persuaded this idolatrous Levite to come with them and help them set up a a pagan shrine in Dan, they could never have known what they were about to cause in Israel. Because of this, there would then be idolatry in Israel for 500 years. This would all end with their people being carried off into captivity. And not only that, when they come back from captivity, they are still oppressed. And so when you get to the intertestamental period, when you get to by about 168 to 165 BC, then we find that there is still trouble, nothing but trouble. So many innocent people are hurt because because of this. And the dominoes fall because they reached a tipping point on that day. And they would never have known it. And that's how it is. Tipping points for good occur in our lives and tipping points for evil. And I think that ought to be our prayer then. That today we would ask the Lord to create tipping points for good in our lives and not for evil. Good for us good for our loved ones, good for who knows how many others. So will you pray with me in your hearts as I ask the Lord to give us tipping points for good in our lives today. Father God, we do indeed ask that there would be tipping points, that dominoes would begin to fall. But we pray that they would be tipping points for good and that we would be good 
that we would take advantage of these opportunities and do good for ourselves, for our loved ones, and for who knows how many people. In all this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' very good name. Amen. Well, again, God bless you today. Thank you for being with me on day 85 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast, and I sure hope I get to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.